Aiden pushed through the growth at the forest edge, rushing through the vines and thorns that pulled at his jeans. Aiden was fueled by his grief and the hurt he felt. Aiden felt betrayed by Kraltagar, though he was a complete stranger, but he was not a stranger. He knew him somehow. He could recall him vaguely, a tall figure that seemed to stretch upwards. He stood tall, but not over people. Aiden could remember his kindness, from his face to his words, a blurred face slowly adjusting like the image in a camera. Aiden felt the frustration you feel when you do not understand as hard as you try. It was only the edge of the wood that was difficult to traverse, the new growth thick. Once he entered the forest, in the shadows of older trees could he easily stroll without worrying of tripping. It was much darker beneath the canopy. The doves, Telius and Delius, flew over Aiden's head. He watched the doves land on a small sapling, its bark like small iron plates, leaves like small fur needles. Aiden stepped over a fallen log, approached the small white feathered birds. The doves cooed, while cleaning their white feathers with the tips of their black beaks. They paid no attention to Aiden, who got so close to the two doves that he could see the color of their eyes, the almost reptile-like legs. At one point, they made eye contact for the longest moment. Both had orange eyes, both unblinking. Tellius and Delius, Aiden talked to them as if they were another person the same way he did Calder, though not in the way that a dog parent talks to their fur baby, but as if addressing an actual human being. He reached out and gently stroked them. You are the only animals that I have never been able to communicate with. Why is that? Aiden asked them. They only stared back. No answer came from them. With his ability to talk to animals, he had learned that different animals had varying levels of communication. Some were clearly more intelligent. Calder was smart, but very goofy, very much like what is commonly thought of a dog's personality. As he stood contemplating the mysteries of the twin doves, a new memory began to return. The scene was blurry, a dark tunnel ascending upward. He could make out the outline of light, a pure light not produced by flame. The scene began to come into focus, voices from far away, muffled. Aiden, Eleanor, and a armored man climbed up a spiral staircase, walls brightly lit with glowing crystals. The armored man was the same figure that had escorted him up the mountain path to his father. Quiltigar, said Eleanor, her braid were much shorter, hair long and curly. He is the master of magics and my mentor. The three of them climbed the last stair, stopping outside a large, heavy door. Carved in the door was the goddess, surrounded by vines, green leaves, and goddess bells. Two doves, one flying above her head, the other at her feet. In her hands, held close to her chest, were where the heart would be located, a small flame. Eleanor walked forward, past the armored man, his face blurred, unfocused, the symbol of the Vil Knight upon his chest, a sword wrapped in a crimson cloth. He placed his hand firmly upon Aiden's shoulder, preventing Aiden from following Eleanor. The Master of Magics is with the council members. It would be rude to enter his quarters uninvited. Eleanor opened the door, opening easily for such a heavy door. She spun around, giggling. Quiltigar will not care. Eleanor walked forward, grabbed hold of Aiden's hands, pulling him from the armored man. Don't think about sneaking out, the armored man called out after them. We can't have the two of you wandering the streets of Telegran again. Once in the room, Eleanor closed the door leaving the unfocused-faced man standing in the hall. Quiltigar isn't just my mentor, Aiden. To be honest, I love him as if he was my father. 
I promise, Aiden, you will like Quiltigar. The room was neat and tidy. An iron bird cage set next to an open window, a light cold breeze circulating through the room. A wind chime chimed. The chime was finely crafted. A carved base of wood. There were flowers, dandelions, and red seeded dandelions being danced across the carved wood. Wind carved into it, depicted with swoosh like lines. It chimed lightly. On a small table below the open window was a crystal. Three lumps of crystal. At its center, purple mist formed into a small cyclone, slowly disappearing into the center of the crystal. Where all three lumps met was a large jewel, faintly glowing with purple light. There were bookcases upon bookcases, neat stacks of books, a simple wooden desk with quills and a high-backed chair. Eleanor walked behind the desk, pulled out the chair. It screeched upon the stone floor. No carpets. Eleanor sat upon the chair, wiggling upon it, trying to adjust herself. It's not really comfortable. Got a bony butt, complained Eleanor, as Aiden walked about Quiltigar's study in amazement. Aiden walked to the open window, admiring the twirling cyclone and the detailed wind chime, looking past it to the city below, its streets lit by lanterns and ever-burning crystal light posts. My dad always said that I was bony. He always let me sit on his lap anyways. I believe him now that I'm sitting on this chair. I miss him added Eleanor, under her breath. I'm sorry, Aiden replied, glancing from a stack of books next to the leg of the desk. He looked toward Eleanor, who sat looking toward the window. I know how you feel, Aiden said, walking to the window. I never knew my mother. When he reached the window, Aiden leaned out the window. Looking downward, it was a long way down. He could see Lost Temple Courtyard way below. It was indeed the tallest tower of Lost Temple, just as Eleanor had explained, climbing up the spiral staircase. Two white blurs zoomed past him. Aiden jumped back from the win opened window, startled. Heart thumping in his chest, there was a beating of wings in the birdcage. Two white doves now sat in the once empty birdcage. I didn't sense them, and I can't hear them, Aiden said aloud in wonder. Telius and Delius are Quiltigar's familiars. They are magical beings just as much as they are doves, Eleanor explained to Aiden, who watched the two doves. Aiden smiled. Enola is what I always thought it would be, and more, Aiden exclaimed excitedly. I hope the High King will allow my father to come back with me. I would very much like to live here. I would miss my friends of Earth. They will be fine, and I'm sure they would understand. Aiden looked away from the doves, back to Eleanor. Standing next to her was a tall man wearing long, flowing blue robes, mustard trimming, a hood that hung down his shoulders. On his belt, many vials varying from powders, liquid, and glowing pebbles. The layered robes almost covered his sandaled feet. Aiden saw the look that passed between the man and Eleanor. A feeling of disappointment rose from within. Aiden did not understand any of the Alliance Summit that had just concluded, nor did he know what would happen to memory-weaving ritual. The man that stood before him was Eleanor's mentor, Queltigar, who had stood up to the High King, voting against the ritual. Aiden sat upon the fallen log he had crossed. A thin, stalked crop of mushrooms grew up the log. The cap looked like a blue skirt. The tip curled like a perfect scoop of ice cream upon a cone. Darkness had fallen. In the direction he had come, he could hear Eleanor and Yorge. The pony that pulled the caravan gratefully grazed nearby, thankful for resting and the feed she was fed. Fireflies flew around the forest edge, lighting up one after the other. The doves roosted in the limbs close together, heads tucked beneath their wings. Aiden, I am truly sorry. Quiltigar stood in the clearing to the side of Aiden, just out of his peripherals. He held his staff before him, 
a small dome of light surrounding him, the light being produced by a jewel set into his staff. Aiden did not know how long he had sat upon the fallen tree, alone in the clearing. Neither did he remember ever sitting down. I hope you can forgive me. The memory-weaving ritual, it is a responsibility that I wish was never a duty of the Master of Magics. The memory-weaving ritual, it brought with it a remembrance of sadness. Aiden could not remember the ritual fully, but he could remember the emotion he felt that day. It felt like he was being banished from his home, told to never return, to never remember. I do forgive you. Aiden felt silly for ever being upset in the first place. He actually felt like an ass for showing his ass. Aiden felt himself start to blush for his outburst and the way he had acted earlier. I'm sorry also, Koltagar. I remember the night in your study and that you fought for me. I don't remember it all. It is slowly returning to me. The weavers are a branch of magic next to the witches of the endless bog that I truly despise. Even us mistcasters can misuse our gifts. The weavers and witches don't help with the distrust that is felt toward us. Koltagar moved to stand before Aiden. The sphere of light distorted and changed around the orb in his staff, the light taking the shape of a hanging lantern. The weavers? Witches? Aiden asked. He was beginning to feel excited about the possibility of learning more about Enola. There was so much that Christopher never told him of the world he thought was a fantasy. Was that a witch that appeared bef before me on Earth? Before his first sojourn to Enola? Aiden wondered, thinking back to his adventure with Oscar and Willow when they went adventuring in the narrow mountains. Part of that time of his life was blurry, just as his now returning memories. It's no doubt the trauma, Christopher had explained. You were lost in the mountains for quite some time. Aiden stood, rubbing his temples, feeling the pressure of a future migraine. Will you forgive me for being an ass? asked Aiden, looking into the old man's face. Queltigar tilted his head down, nodding in answer. After Queltigar collected the doves who perched on the tip of Queltigar's staff, Aiden followed him into the camp that was set up outside his caravan. It was set up just as it was previous set up the night before on the beach. Eleanor stood at the fire. A cast iron pot hung over the fire. She stirred its contents with a wooden spoon. George paced outside of the perimeter of the camp, watching the wood line they had disappeared and returned from. Your tantrum over, he barked at Aiden. Aiden felt his neck start to burn out of embarrassment for the way he had acted. Aiden glanced toward Eleanor, who did not look up from her task. He walked past George, who stood watching him with arms crossed. Aiden's mouth began to feel dry, just as he was about to apologize for the way he acted. Quiltigar spoke up. George, no need for hostility. Aiden has quite has had quite a lot happen to him these past two days. The way he acted can be overlooked and forgiven. Go survey the area, or smoke the slug that you're so fond of. George stormed off through the forest, following the road just as Aiden weakly apologized to the man. When Queltigar and Aiden entered the glow of the campfire, Eleanor stopped stirring, pointing in the direction of Yorge. He has no room to talk. That man is always being an ass. Queltigar laughed heartedly, coughing as he went to place the two, the two doves in the iron cage that hung just outside the caravan. Aiden joined Eleanor by the fire, he was greeted by the aroma of the food within the cast-iron pot. He peeked to see what she was cooking. 
There are sliced potatoes, onions, and slices of dried meat. Aiden assumed the meat was deer. Eleanor smiled. The light of the fire laid her face. She appeared to be enjoying herself. My mother is better at this. To be honest, I can't wait to return to Telegram. We have servants that bring us our meals in Lost Temple. Lost Temple, the bastion of the Elder Knights, watchers and sorcerers of Enola. Quiltigar's quarters had been in the tallest tower, and Aiden was lost in thought of Lost Temple. He sat upon the stairs of the caravan. Before he knew it, the pan-fried potatoes were done. Eleanor had brought him a heaping plate that steamed in a wooden cup. I prepared more Van Julia tea if you need it. She took off her water skin from her belt. This is water if you're, if you're not filling the tea. Aiden took the plate of potatoes, a cup of tea, and water skin. He placed the cup and water at his feet. As Eleanor turned to return to the fire, Aiden said, Hey, Eleanor, I'm sorry about the way I acted earlier. It wasn't fair to you, Queltigar or Yorge. Eleanor turned back to Aiden and waved her hand in a don't worry about it kind of gesture. Don't worry about it, she said. Queltigar is always telling me that my emotions are volatile. He is right, though. I do need to control it. Like I said, don't worry, and no need to be embarrassed. Some of the potatoes were tender, others still crunchy. When George returned, he made sure to point out that his roasted potatoes were still raw. Eleanor cursed him under her breath, collecting all their plates, taking them to the wash bin. Aiden offered to help, but was told to take it easy. Aiden wanted to be busy. He actually longed for the busy work to keep his mind occupied. He returned to his seat, picking up his now cold cup of tea. He took a couple sips, then slowly poured it onto the ground. Aiden was not a fan of how the tea made him feel weak and numb. Quiltigar smoked upon his pipe, and Yorge never taking his eyes off the forest edge. Just when they were beginning to turn in for the night, the wildlife hushed. It went silent. No hoot of an owl. The bugs stopped singing. Even the fireflies that were lighting up the forest edge seemed to disappear. The tea Aiden had sipped upon had worked fast and had already stifled their voices. The tiredness he felt suddenly gone. The doves suddenly woke within their iron cages a flutter of wings as they threw themselves against the iron bars. George, George! Quiltigar called out as he stepped out of the caravan, grabbing his staff. Eleanor dropped the dish she was washing upon the ground, also taking up her staff. An arrow appeared in Yorge's neck. Yorge's body limply fell to the ground. Aiden stood. He watched his limp body fall. The blood pooled around his neck. Around him, things seemed to move in slow motion. Cloaked figures appeared out of nowhere. The mule darted through the camp. These men wore long, dark robes around their chest with thick plates of armor. Over their faces they wore white masks with horns jutting from where their foreheads would be. The masked men's statures were tall, and they wielded long, curved swords. And from the forest edge there were more men, bows in hand, ready to let arrows fly. There was a second wave of arrows let loose before those with swords rushed forward. That is when Aiden threw himself to the ground. Arrows flew by where he had stood moments before. Queltigar reacted fast, standing the charging men with staff in hand. He thrust his staff forward, sending a burst of air from the tip of it. The men that were unfortunate to be in the path of the blast of air was sent flying backwards. Some went skyward, back into the forest edge. Others smashed into whoever was behind them. Aiden lay upon the ground next to George's body, hand over his head, breathing in earth. The cloaked men darted past him. For the briefest of a second, Aiden thought, they must think one of arrows took my life just as George. There were other scarier thoughts that assaulted him as the scene around him seemed to unfold at a snail pace. The attackers were resilient. They continued to push forward, and the ever-present mist began to fade as the mist was being used up. 
the sorcerer's spells began to weaken. One of the masked men approached sword tip forward. Eleanor sent a small ball of flame. He dodged with a quick sidestep, swinging his sword. Eleanor moved to parry with her staff. Aiden, without thinking what he was doing, reached out for Yorge's longbow, slowly lifted himself up upon his knees, knocked an arrow, and let loose. The arrow landed into the man's shoulder, staggering him. Before he could recover, Eleanor swung the tip of her staff. It connected with the attacker's head. It fell to the ground. He had never practiced archery, but he seemed to take it up easily. Or had he? He went through the process of it like muscle memory. After that first arrow flew through the air, connecting with Aiden's target, the snail-like pace lifted. A furious, frantic, desperate fight for the lives began to unfold. Every arrow that Aiden knocked, he sent flying toward non-lethal locations. He was terrified of actually taking someone's life, even though they meant to take theirs. Aiden had picked up the fallen watcher's sword. Growing up, he always thought he could easily bested foe at swordplay, thinking himself a swordmaster. But now that he had a sword in hand, and it had come true, he could not bring himself to use it. So Aiden swung his sword, deflecting blows, keeping the attackers in the night at bay. They don't know what I'm capable of, thought Aiden. He was surprised that he could do even that. It was as if he had at one time picked up a sword. The movement came to him naturally, his feet moving as if on their own. One of the men had managed to flank Quiltigar from the side. He rose his sword to strike the warlock. Eleanor appeared with her staff engulfed in flames and ignited the attacker with a swing of it. The attacker screeched, dropped his sword, slotting at the flames that scorched him. He ran blindly away from them, back into the forest. Quiltigar and Eleanor stood side by side, sending bursts of magic into their attacker's ranks. The mist around them swirled and absorbed into their staves, then unleashed into a form of magic energy. The mist, the fuel for their magic. Quiltigar, covered by Eleanor's spark of fire, fought his way toward the cart, his staff blocking and striking his opponents. The birds were a flutter of wings and fright, but when Quiltigar reached out for their cage, removing it from where he hung them, they calmed. Aiden watched as the old man hung the cage upon the hook of his staff. He chanted. Aiden, likewise. Aiden, likewise, was given cover by a blast of Eleanor's flame. Eleanor and Aiden made their way toward Kualtagar, who still chanted. Once more, Quiltigar let loose a ball of fire, followed by, by smashing his staff into the ground at his feet. A barrier of swirling wind surrounded his staff, and there he stayed, taking a defensive posture. Blades and arrows smashed into the barrier of swirling wind that surrounded the three of them. His free hand danced, gathering the purple mist with his free hand, pulling in the magic into his staff. No. The birdcage glowed a pure white light. The bird's cooing became a song. It was celestial, unlike any song Aiden had heard before. Eleanor's spells came to a halt. Eleanor's spells had came to a halt, as all the magic had been drained from the area. The last of the mist was drawn into the bird cage, hanging from Quiltigar's staff. Eleanor slammed her staff into a masked man, who broke through the barrier of wind from behind, who had almost gone unnoticed. Quiltigar! called Eleanor, beginning to sound frantic. Down! Down! Both of you! shouted Quiltigar. Eleanor and Aiden fell to the ground as Quiltigar threw open the radiant cage and held the staff above his head with both hands. Then there was a burst of light, followed by Deline and Tellius. They were a projectile of pure white light in the shape of an arrow, Feathers of pure magical energy followed in their wake. They entered into their attacker's chest like a bullet fired from a gun. Then they blew out of the back of the attacker they entered. 
Aiden watched in both fascination and horror as the birds exploded into the attacker's chest. Blood and glowing feathers splattered from the entry point, and when they reappeared, they were winged arrows heading straight to the next target. It wasn't long before all the attackers had been dealt with, leaving Eleanor and Aiden laying upon the ground with the dead. Kultigar stood at the center of the dead. Their victory was short-lived, as shouts could be heard in the dark. From the direction of the clearing, Aiden had visited at dusk. We should move, Kultigar said as the bird still, faintly glowing, flew off into the night. Kultigar motioned for them to follow him into the dark forest ahead. Kultigar, what about the caravan? asked Eleanor, stepping up onto the stairs, leading up into the wagon. There is no time. It can be replaced. Our lives cannot. Kultigar tugged at her sleeves, pulling her with little resistance. The pony is far off from here. It added Aiden, collecting George's backpack that sat next to the watcher's bedroll. Or worse, slaughtered in the attack, thought Aiden. Should we prepare a illumination spell? asked Eleanor, already beginning the process of drawing in the mist around here, or the mist that remained. They followed the sorcerer, still on the road. From the direction they had come from, no doubt at the side of their ambush, voices could be heard. Quiltigar glanced that way and back to Eleanor. No, we will rely upon the light of the moons. We would draw them to us if we cast. With that said, Quiltigar stepped off the road and disappeared into the forest. Eleanor shared a look with Aiden before joining the warlock into the darker shadows of the forest. Aiden slung the watcher's backpack over his shoulder, as well as the bow and the scabbardless sword, blade held down. They traveled through the mist. It was cloudy. The moons in the sky above was concealed in brief intervals, the moons disappearing shortly and then reappearing once more. Their path they took would become darkened by the moon's disappearing act, causing them to trip upon underbrush. Aiden, on the other hand, he caught on fast once his eyes became, became adjusted. It was like he was slowly becoming one with the forest. He was self-aware of the limbs above, dancing in the wind, and he could sense rabbits and other small game scurrying away from their path. The tea's effects were beginning to wore off. George's backpack upon Aiden's back kept Aiden's mind anchored to reality. Every so often, it would bounce on his back, a sharp object poking him in the small of the back. Late that night, as they became fatigued, the wind carried with it a lonely howl of a wolf. It was eerily beautiful, yet it reminded Aiden that the wolves were not the only ones on the hunt. Not much was said between them. They kept pushing forward. Night became dawn before Queltigar spoke. We rest here, pointing to a small boulder. Moss grew in its shadow. The path had begun to become rocky and to become steeper. We shall arrive at the pass between Dirge by midday. Get what rest while you can. Quiltigar placed his staff into the ground, silver bird cage empty, little doors left open. The warlock climbed atop the boulder, set upon it with legs crossed. He watched silently in the direction that they had fled. Eleanor leaned against the boulder Quiltigar set upon, his back to them slightly above them. She crossed her arms across her chest, staff in the crook of her elbows. It amazed Aiden how fast sleep took her. Aiden struggled to get any sort of rest. When he did finally nod off, he woke up shortly to the cooing of Deline and Tellius. The following morning, at midday, the mountain path came into view. Dirge was covered in thick forest, like the Appalachian Mountain of North America. The purple mist seemed to gather in the mountain. It floated between the trees, seeming to struggle to free from the overhanging tree limbs. The path between the mountain was thick with the mist also, as if it was trapped between the rock faces as much as the trees. Nearing the pass, 
Aiden saw the floating city of Telegram on the other side of the range, and a small ship sailing through the air. It descended just on the other side of the pass. Sky ships, enchanted cells and wood that can manipulate the mist around it to fly through the sky. They arrived at the path. Over rocks they climbed, they crossed a mountain river by a well-maintained rope bridge. Onto the bank opposite, they fled across muddy ground. Large tumbled boulders dotted the small canyon that at one time came loose from the cliffs above. Aiden looked from the cliffs above, then behind them, expecting the masked men to reappear. Calm yourself, Aiden, Kultigar said, reaching out giving Eleanor aid as she crossed the mud that threatened to make her lose her footing. The old sorcerer also scanned the ridge above, where mountain trees grew. Old they were, trunks thick, vines growing off them. We are in the wardens of the woods' domain. We are more likely to encounter them. They are allies of the warlocks of Telegram. Wood wardens? The druids of Enola? said Aiden recalling the tales Christopher told of them. He could actually hear Christopher's voice within his mind. This echo pulled at his heartstrings. Eventually, they reached the end of the canyon. It was cold between the shadows of the mountains, and the party was glad to be out of the pass. Aiden, Qualtagar, and Eleanor found a dirt road. Cartwheels had worn uneven ruts into the road. Queltigar led them up the inclined road. The forest began to thin. Wildlife began to become less. In the forest, it appeared that the trees were being cleared away. It seemed as if the woodcutters had left the area in a hurry. Their equipment was left about the site. Queltigar led them through the middle of the site, large piles of lumber left unattended, rotting where they lay. They pushed forward, following a new path that was created by wagons hauling lumber. The path was littered with pine needles. The scent, the sweet scent of the pines, began to mingle with the smell of livestock. They climbed a small hill, and at the top, they found themselves looking at a short stretch of a valley. A small village could be seen in the distance, smoke drifting from chimneys. Surrounding the village was plowed fields. The village broke up by creeks, wooden houses built on stacked stone and sod-roofed 